Today, we share in a blessing for losers, risk takers, all failures far and wide. Blessed are they who fall in the mud, who jump with gusto and rip the pants, who skin the elbows and bruise the ego, for they shall know the sweetness of risk. Blessed are they who make giant mistakes, whose intentions are good but impact has injured, who know the hot sense of regret and ask for mercy, for their hearts will know the gift of forgiveness. Blessed are they who have seen a D or an F or C or any letter less than perfect, who are painfully familiar with the red pen and the labels as less than, for they know the wisdom in the imperfect. Blessed are they who try again, who dust off, who wash up, who extend the wish for peace, who return to sites of failure, who are dogged in their pursuit, for they will discover the secret to dreams. Blessed are they who refuse to listen to the naysayers, for their hearts will be houses of hope. Blessed are they who see beyond the surface of another, for they will be able to delight in the gift of compassion. Blessed are they who stop running the race to help a fellow traveler, who pick up the fallen, who stop for injured life, for they shall know the kindness of strangers. Blessed are they who wildly, boldly abandon winning, for they shall know the path of justice. Words by Robin Tanner. Matt for that call to worship. We light this chalice, symbol of our purpose to bring more love and justice into the world. We light this chalice 
knowing our congregation as a church dispersed across communities, not bound by walls, but connected through the web of life. Good morning and welcome. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> I didn't give you a chance there. <laughs> welcome to East Rose Fellowship Unitarian Universalist. Everyone here in the chapel and also online, including our speaker. Welcome to first time visitors or those of you who have only come once or twice before. I met Rodney this morning, yes. He said he recognized me from online. Well, that was exciting, yes. <laughs> We're very glad you're here. I'm Cynthia Hopkins, your worship leader this morning. Our speaker, whom you've seen recently on the screen, is Matthew Pargeter Villarreal, a candidate for Minister of Eastros. Matt attends church here with us today in Gresham, Oregon, from Albuquerque, New Mexico, via the wizardry of technology. Welcome to Eastros, Matt. Matt recently completed a year of ministry as an intern at the First Unitarian Church of Albuquerque. That is a very large church. I looked it up online. The final step in his process is the interview with the national credentialing body of the church, the Ministerial Credentialing Committee. And he anticipates this will happen within a few months time when they next convene. They only meet three times a year. His sermon today is entitled, Adventures in Failing, and he promises to take us on a journey of some of his failures and the impact they had on his life and how he wouldn't have it any other way. Now, this is a time when we take a moment to greet each other, whether here in the chapel or online, but before you jump up, I'm excited to share that we have a new way to do this, which we're gonna debut right now. Q John. Ta da! John has positioned a camera up here in, in the front so all of us can see those who are in the chapel, including all of those people online. Now, if you're along the walls, you probably aren't in this picture. Although, I see Selena, she's just sitting down. Okay, have we got those on the back wall over there? Raise your hand and um, yeah, okay, kinda, we can kinda see you. Okay, so let's give this a go. Wave to the folks online. <laughs> and then we can turn and greet each other here in the chat. Yay. You're never done. If I don't do this, we'd be here all day doing that. <laughs> At this point, I'd like to do this very serious and very important acknowledgement of the lands where our fellowship gathers and that are home now to widespread communities. These lands where our church stands were the traditional village sites of many Native American tribes, Multnomah, Wasco, Wishram, Cowlitz, Kathlamet, Clackamas, and bands of Chinook, Tualatin, Kalapuya, Malala, and many others. They made their lives right here. We thank these original caretakers and their descendants who are among us still. In peace, may we share this land and honor one another. Please rise now and let's sing our opening hymn. It's 364 in the gray hymnal but also the words will be on the screen and I think this is a pretty familiar tune for all of us. 
I'm not going to play it through. You know it. I'll just give. That's it. right. We I know it. Come sing a song with me. Good morning again, everyone. It is my pleasure to share this very brief but wonderful story time, which is one of my favorites. Um, there was a gentleman a number of years ago, a philosopher by the name of Alan Watts, who used to go around to college campuses and give lectures. And during his lectures, he would tell a Chinese fable called The Parable of the Chinese Farmer. And that is the story that I have for you today. Once upon a time, there was a Chinese farmer whose horse ran away. That evening, all of his neighbors came around to commiserate. They said, we are so sorry to hear that your horse has run away. This is most unfortunate. The farmer said, maybe. The next day, the horse came back, bringing seven wild horses with it. In the evening, everybody came back and said, oh, isn't that lucky? What a great turn of events. You now have eight horses. The farmer again said, maybe. The following day, his son tried to break one of the horses, and while riding it, he was thrown and broke his leg. The neighbors then said, oh dear, that's too bad. And the farmer responded, maybe. The next day, the conscription officers came around to conscript people into the army, and they rejected his son because he had a broken leg. Again, all of the neighbors came around and said, isn't that great? And again, the farmer said, maybe. <laughs> the whole process of nature is an integrated process of immense complexity. And it's really impossible to tell whether anything that happens in it is good or bad because you never know what will be the consequence of the misfortune 
or you never know what will be the consequences of good fortune. Often, we label our experience as bad if we hate it, and good if we like it. The bad cannot exist without the good, and vice versa. Whatever happens in our life, we'll never know the consequences it may bring in the future. Thank you, Matt. I hadn't heard that story in a long time. It's time for our offering. Every week in the church, we take up an offering. It's good to remind ourselves from time to time that this is symbolic as well as practical. We know it's through pledges that we build our budget, fund our programs, our ministries of worship, religious education, pay our staff, et cetera, et cetera, and finance the comfort and beauty of our buildings. And we know that we could easily submit those pledge checks to the church at any convenient time or do it online like most of us do. But we pass the plate during our worship service to make a community expression of thanks for the blessing of abundance to visibly bring in the harvest at this most cherished hour of our week. And here at East Rose, we share half of our offering with a community nonprofit that we support. And this month and for the next two, month, two more months, it is Nadaka Park, just down the road there. Just take a little walk to get there. Our offering says that the act of giving is as essential to our spiritual well being as anything else we do here on Sunday mornings. If you attend online, you probably know by now you can donate by visiting the website and click on the donate button or scan the QR code on your screen, which will take you there too. This morning's offering will now be given and received in the spirit of grateful fellowship. And Jean is gonna help me collect this. And I would ask you to please remain seated while we sing our old favorite, hymn number 123, <coughs> Spirit of Life.
Our reading for today is entitled Found While Lost by the Reverend Eric W. Martinez Wesley. The beauty of the world is the mouth of a labyrinth, writes Simone Weil. We would be foolish not to follow its call. And so we enter the labyrinth, lured by the whiff of a dream still in the making, the possibility of a new relationship, the promise of a new career, the potential for a new beginning. We can never be sure of what we will find once inside. But this much is certain. There will be times when the beauty of the world and with it the entrance to the labyrinth unexpectedly disappear. Some relationships will disintegrate, some careers will dissatisfy, some beginnings will disappoint. Unable to find the labyrinth's opening, we often find ourselves in frantic search of an escape, fumbling for the next step, tiring ourselves out in the process. Disheartened, dispirited, we feel disoriented. We get lost. The question is not whether we will get lost in life, but rather how we will move through it in faith. Will we dwell on everything that we have lost? Or will we focus instead on everything that we have yet to find? As it happens, there is much that awaits us in our lostness. Much to be excavated, examined, even exalted. In not yet knowing what will be, we are afforded the opportunity to appreciate what already is, the things hiding in plain sight. Afraid relationship, for example, may reveal our deeper needs. An unfulfilling career may motivate, may motivate us to seek out a mentor. A misstart or a misstep may remind us of our own fragile humanity. It may claw open our hearts and sensitize us to the suffering of others. When lost, perhaps the greatest question our faith asks of us is this. How will we be found? Once the time is ripe, the stars align, and the way begins to open, Will we be ready to embrace the mystery anew? Will we choose to trust anew, to risk anew, to hope anew? Will we allow ourselves to yet again be drawn in, swept up, taken over by that magic that makes life worth living? In the words of Simone Weil, for if we do not lose courage, if we go on walking, it is absolutely certain that we will finally arrive at the center of the labyrinth. And there, God is waiting. Failure is not an option. Most of us have probably heard those words before. It is a statement attributed to retired NASA flight director and manager Gene Krantz, who served as mission control and was instrumental in organizing the rescue efforts to safely bring back alive the members of the ill-fated Apollo 13 lunar mission in 1970. Krantz claims that he never uttered those immortal words, they were immortalized by Ed Harris in the 1995 movie Apollo 13 and have quickly entered popular culture. The words actually came from flight director Jerry Bostick when asked by Apollo 13 scriptwriters if there were ever any times when people in mission control ever panicked and didn't know what to do. Bostick's reply was, 
quote, no. When bad things happened, we just calmly laid out all the options, and failure was not one of them. It is meant to convey the message that when there is so much at stake in a situation, a person needs to be rational and consider all the possible outcomes in order to be able to calmly choose which is the best for the situation at hand. Now, it's not in my nature to be cynical. And I am aware there are people who will always find a way to succeed despite their circumstances. But I cannot help but look back at my life up to this point and wonder with just the slightest bit of sarcasm that if failure is not truly an option, why is it that I have become so very good at finding a way to end up choosing it? Yet, amid all my colossal failures, I have managed to discover something unexpected and wonderful that has been a byproduct of failing. As much as we are all motivated by the prospect of success, and as much as we all want to succeed, failure, as uncomfortable and unfortunate as it is, can be almost as much of a catalyst to change the direction of one's life as is success. It is in the moments of everything blowing up in our face that we are forced to tap into our creative potential and seek solutions about what we do next. And, as I have encountered through having to bounce back from so many failures, the direction that one's life could end up taking can be more beautiful and do more to prove the work of grace in one's life than we can possibly imagine. So, I invite you to join me for the next 10 to 15 minutes as we embark on a journey of getting smacked in the face and crashing all the way down to the depths of rock bottom. Spoiler alert, there's a happy ending at the end of it all. From a very early age, I was fed the same familiar formula for success from both my parents. Work hard, go to school, get good grades, go to college, continue to get good grades, graduate college, and then go out into the world and find a good paying job that would help set me up for the rest of my future career and future life. Unlike many others, I had the added pressure of being the only child to two parents that were living, breathing examples of success stories. My mom had gone to, on to earn a bachelor's degree in English and then a master's degree from Boston University and was working in public relations for the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and Lawrence General Hospital in Massachusetts. My dad was the classic story of the immigrant living the American dream. After earning his degree in engineering, he left the UK and moved to the US to start a family with my mom, and had slowly been climbing his way up the corporate ladder since he arrived. To my credit, by the time I graduated, I had done a lot to live up to the expectations of success that had been thrust upon me. My grades were excellent, I was graduating as an Oklahoma academic scholar, I had a wide range of extracurricular activities and varsity sports to my name, not to mention being very active in the Anglican church I had grown up in and attended. I'd even managed to win a national championship in Quiz Bowl along the way. I was preparing to attend Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C., my favorite city in the U.S. I received a generous scholarship I was planning to double major in Spanish and secondary education. Everything was being set up and in place for me to live out the rest of my life, a life that was destined to achieve the success that I had been encouraged to pursue. When I arrived in DC, the reality soon became anything but that. I had moved 1,000 miles away from home to a school that was predominantly female, 88% Catholic, overwhelmingly conservative, and whose students come from about four states on the East Coast. To recap, I was male, 
Protestant, liberal, and coming from Texas. It became clear a few weeks after student orientation that I was an outsider with no chance of finding my way in. Extrovert that I am, this didn't stop me. I poured myself into my classes and attended social events, and I managed to acquire a group of a few friends along the way. I even signed up for the freshman retreat that was being held at a campsite in southwestern Maryland. I was determined to make the most of this opportunity and this situation that I had been given. It was the freshman retreat that would prove the most challenging moment of all. In the woods for several days, in a spirit of introspection and encouraged to reflect upon myself, I was forced to confront feelings surrounding my sexual orientation that had been swirling beneath the surface since the summer after high school graduation. After several days of agony, I made the decision that if I was going to be true about the future of my life from here on out, I needed to be honest to myself and to everybody about who I was. So, officially two weeks into my first year of college, I made the decision to come out as being queer. I also made the difficult decision to come out to the close friends that I had made so far in college. Initially, I received a lot of hugs and messages of love and support. This doesn't change anything, they kept assuring me. We still love and support you for who you are. I left the retreat feeling dramatically changed, but also hopeful about how the rest of the year was going to go. When we got back to DC, it became clear that everything had, in fact, changed. As the months went on, the more and more comfortable I became with myself and my sexual orientation, the less that the friends that I had confided in became comfortable with me, and slowly began to distance themselves from associating with me. I had come out in September of the fall semester. By March of spring semester, I had no friends left. No matter, I told myself. I didn't need anyone. I can take care of my emotional support needs myself. Not realizing that I was not in any fit emotional state to be able to do this. I slowly began to downward spiral. Frustration at my situation led to depression. Depression that led to being overwhelmed and tired and wishing that all of these negative feelings would stop, which led to my first experience with rock bottom. At the time, I was taking a science class entitled Chemistry for Non-Chemistry Majors. We were talking about over-the-counter drugs like aspirin and acetaminophen and the professor for mere trivia's sake, mentioned about how many tablets would make up a lethal dose of Tylenol. I went back to my dorm room after the class to the bottle of Tylenol extra strength I had in my bedroom, counted out that many tablets, put them into a container, and put the container in the, cor in the corner of my desk drawer, with the logic that if things ever got to be too much to handle, that this was my way out. I never did use them as my way out. A few weeks later, when I was lying down in my dorm room from what was probably more clinical depression than the headache that I claimed it was, I heard a voice clear as day in my ear that said, and I quote, what the F are you doing? Get off your ass and get to the counseling center because you need help and you need it now. End quote. <laughs> to this day, I cannot explain the origin of that voice. I like to tell the story that this is when I knew that God spoke to me, but apparently the divine swears like a sailor if that is the case. <laughs> Either way, it had its intended effect. I did get up and walked up the hill through the rain to the counseling center. By the time that I arrived, any thoughts of self-harm had been erased from my mind, 
but they still made me sit down with one of the counselors and fill out paperwork. For those of you that have never had to fill out outpatient paperwork for suicidal ideation, this is three pages of being asked questions such as, on a scale of one to 10, how much do you love yourself? And what are the factors that would prohibit you from carrying through with your plan? It was not until I got halfway through the second page that I realized that this was no longer me simply not handling things well. This was my health in jeopardy. It was the wake-up call that I needed in order to make a change. I made the grueling decision to finish out the year and then moved back to San Antonio. I imagine at this point that there are probably some of you listening to my story and thinking to yourselves, oh, but you didn't really fail. Things just didn't go the way that you wanted them to. And in hindsight, you would be right. But at that point in my life, I couldn't hide the fact that I felt like a complete failure. Success to me has always been presented in this package of once you go to college, you are supposed to continue an upward trajectory without any eruptions along the way until your end goal of success is achieved. For me, I had taken a complete detour. My chance at life in my favorite city had come crashing down. My future at my dream university had completely blown up in my face. I had moved out on my own and was independent from my parents. Now I was moving back into my old house and my old bedroom with my tail between my legs. And to top it all off, I was starting over again as a completely different person that I didn't completely know or could name yet as myself. Failure had become more than an option. It was the new reality that I was now facing. I did promise you a happy ending. As it turned out, moving back to San Antonio was exactly what I needed. In fact, my move back to Texas was the furthest thing from being a failure. It was the success that I needed in disguise. Being closer to family helped me succeed in feeling loved, which helped me succeed in learning to love myself again. I got to start over in a brand new school environment, but this time I got to be completely open and honest about who I was. And I succeeded in finding fellow classmates and friends who truly accepted and embraced me for it. I even got to be honest about my future. I changed my second major from secondary education to international studies because while I have all the respect in the world for teachers and the work that they do, I discovered that it wasn't for me. Once I made that choice, I found success in a degree plan that I was happy about, one that made me excited to go to school and pour myself into my studies. I was also successful in growing up a little. I got to date and eventually lucked out and achieved the greatest success of all, finding the person of my dreams who loved me for me, failures and all. And we were together when we were able to successfully realize a dream of both of ours, being able to get married both in the eyes of God and the world. Now, that's not to say that the road from then until now did not have its share of failures along the way. There were struggles with alcohol that I had to overcome that cost me a career as a paralegal, a failure that I am still not proud of and that I am still learning to talk about to this day. But even during that failure, I not only overcame the circumstances and found my way into recovery, but it led me down a completely different road to successfully finding the career path I am now on that gives me the most purpose, becoming a minister. 
If anything, my constant string of failures has taught me that if you're going to have any chance at success, you need to redefine what success is and what it looks like. For so many years, I operated under the expectation of what others thought my success should look like and struggled to mold myself to that. But true success only comes when you personalize it, make it your own, and when you do so in spite of all of your circumstances. I also learned the, the things that we see as failure and the things that we have been taught to view as failure or not living up to our potential are often golden opportunities to find the success that we desperately crave if only we are willing to lean into them and see them from the, for the possibilities that they are. So, as uncomfortable as the failures may be, I know that they will be there. And every time that they will come up, I will curse and whine and get discouraged. But once that is all out of my system, I will grit my teeth and dust myself off, find a way to keep moving forward. I look at it like this. It is through all of the failures that I've had so far, which have led me to being here before you all and bearing my soul. If that is the result of failure, then I cannot wait to see what else the future has in store through me through my own adventures in failing. What about you, friends? What could be possible for you if you stopped seeing failure as the end of the world? What if instead it was the possibility that you had never expected to cross your path? These questions are not for me to answer for you. I can only echo the words of Simone Vile that we heard in Eric Martinez Wesley's reading from today. For if we do not lose courage, if we go on walking, it is absolutely certain that we will finally arrive at the center of the labyrinth. And there, God is waiting. May it ever continue to be so. Blessed be. Amen. Shalom. Assalamu alaikum. Namaste. Thank you all very much for this time that we have shared together. I'm sure many of you are having thoughts like I did of how that relates to things in my life and we will have an opportunity to talk with Matt afterwards. So hang on to those thoughts. Right now we're going to uh, sing our closing hymn. I'll ask you to stand. It's number six, just as long as I have breath. It, it will be a video, but you can sing along with it. As long as I have breath, I must answer yes to life. Though with pain I made my way, still with hope I meet each day. If they asked what I did well, tell them I said yes to Yeah. 
We extinguish this flame, but not its meaning and mission in our hearts. Our time together has come to an end. Go in peace, be of service to one another, and may you move through the world in love for all of your days. May you embrace everything that comes your way in life and may you lean into it like the possibility that it has the potential to be. May it ever continue to be so. Amen and blessed be. Our service has ended, but my friends, your service has just begun. Go in peace, go in joy, go in love. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know what that slide had. <laughs> thank you everyone who contributed to this week's service. Matt, thank you so much for that sermon. John, Phyllis, who isn't here today, but she did a lot of work behind the scenes getting ready for this. Mary, Bonna, Jean for helping me with the collection. 
and for making the coffee today. Thank you very much. I have a couple of uh, announcements handed to me. Uh, here's from Eric. The next three upcoming hikes will be easier ones on flat ground and close to home. That's to encourage us to come, right? Uh, okay, so this Wednesday, the 13th, meet at East Rose at nine o'clock. You're gonna go to Peninsula Park Spectacular Rose Garden in North Portland. Then stroll down North Mississippi Avenue. I'm not gonna read all of this, still can get in touch with you. But the good news is you're gonna have lunch at a local stand, a restaurant, or a brew pub. Okay, so there's your encouragement. Um, also from Keen, uh, he was one of the people, there were a lot of people out here I wanna thank. Yesterday they were out here cleaning up the grounds. They were really working hard. And uh, Keen says, there is a small pile of wood in the front parking lot, what, just right, right behind, yeah, over here. And if you want some, it's first come, first serve. Take it home, right? Get it out of here. Get it out of here. That's, yeah, I vote for that. Um, a special congregational meeting is gonna be held at 12 noon next Sunday, the 17th, for a vote on Matthew's application for Ministry of Eastros. All members will receive a postal letter with instructions and much more background information. I got mine yesterday, so yeah. So you should be getting it. If you haven't gotten it already, go check your mailbox and you should get it tomorrow or very soon. Um, and, then the, and then that Sunday morning, our speaker will be uh, Reverend Larry Jorgensen. His sermon is entitled, R is for Resentment. And Reverend Katie Larcell will be the worship leader. So I encourage you to come to that. Stay at 12 for the, um, the meeting and the vote. And um, this concludes our service, but stay tuned. We have also arranged for us all, all of us, to participate in cafe conversations, not just those at home. Through John's wizardry, we're all gonna be able to do this together Everyone that's online needs to exit YouTube and log into Zoom, as you have been doing. Um, the link should be in pedals. It's on the Eastros website. If you don't easily find it, go to worship and then go to attending on Sundays, you will see it. Um, here at Eastros, we're gonna take a little bit of time to get our coffee, because that's really important to us. Anybody needs a pit stop, they can do that. The coffee's ready to be rolled in. And so let's say at uh, about 10 of, 